Daryl Baskin here, and uh, this is a lecture that I initially created to be one large lecture, but subsequently decided that I should split it up into three to make it a little bit more manageable. So this is part one of three. We'll be talking about central serous chorioretinopathy, and in this one we're primarily going to discuss the pathophysiology and associations found with central serous. This is primarily geared towards a first-year resident. And when that resident sees a patient that they suspect central serous in, I would like for them to think about some of these items. The pathophysiology, the differential, what sorts of questions to ask about in the history, what sorts of things to look for on the exam, what diagnostic imaging to order, management issues and prognosis. And so we're going to address the first third of that in this lecture. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I have no, uh, co I have no, com no problem talking about off-label uses as I am legally allowed to for medication. So uh, briefly, Von Grafe first described central serous chorioretinopathy or CSC back in 1866. Of course, he called it something else. He called it relapsing central loetic retinitis, which uh, still has some relevance today with the first word because we do know that it recurs. And the loetic uh, connection is no longer true. It is not related to syphilis at all. But initially people thought that it was related to this blood vessel spasm, the retinal vessels spasmed, and uh, this led to central serous. That was debunked by Dr. Don Gass once uh, fluorescein angiography came into its own. Uh, he described this dysfunction of the retinal pigment epithelium, the layer underneath the retina, that was not able to hold back that fluid coming forward. And now a lot of people think of, of this as being a choroidal disease, and maybe the RPE is still related uh, pathophysiologically, but more than likely it's sort of an innocent bystander that um, then gets implicated later on in the disease when it becomes more chronic. You could think of, either way I think of this, whether it's right or wrong, um, is that the choroid has too much pressure in it, or too, it's too thick, it's too inflamed, something's wrong with it. And that overwhelms the ability of the RPE to maintain that blood ocular barrier to some degree. And the fluid sort of um, overcomes the RPE much like uh, water through a dam. It breaks through and that fluid accumulates in the subretinal space and then it separates the retina from the RPE which is where it gets a lot of its sort of manicuring and nourishment and metabolic exchange. So when those photoreceptor outer segments are no longer interdigitated with the apices of the retinal pigment epithelium, you are going to have loss of visual function to some degree. And if that fluid lasts long enough, the RPE itself will get damaged. And then even when the subretinal fluid goes away, you will have problems with the neurosensory retina getting the uh, metabolic needs met, and it will atrophy as well. So there you have it. I want to talk about the associations now. Uh, I kind of grouped them into five. And so the first one we'll talk about is steroid use because I think this is one of the most important ones. Carvalho, Recchia, and others uh, performed a case control prospective study. They had 50 patients with central serous and 50 control patients. They found that the central serous patients, 52% of them had used steroids in the prior month versus only 16% in the control group. They went ahead and stopped all the steroids in the CSC patients and 100% of the ones that they stopped the steroids on had resolution of their subretinal fluid. Another study by Sharma, it was a non-comparative prospective study, 24 eyes of CSC patients, again, no control group, already on steroids, and they stopped their steroids. 88% had a resolution of their subretinal fluid. Take-home message, if you can stop steroids, please do. It might result in complete resolution of the disease process. Type A personality. This is one that uh, we learned about early on in residency. Type A people have this competitive drive, a sense of urgency. They're go-getters, aggressive. They could be hostile. Dr. Yanutsi in his AOS thesis paper, I believe is his thesis, uh, looked at 110 patients with central serous, gave them a survey, gave the same survey to 220 other pa people that were controls, and they split them into two groups. And unsurprisingly, 60% uh, of the central serous folks had a type A personality versus 18% of central serous had a type B personality. Um, then compared with the controls, they broke it down to this, to three different subscales, 
and factor S, which stood for speed and impatience, was much higher in the CSR patients. And in terms of job involvement, the middle three, middle uh, grouping of three bars, not much difference. Factor H is hard driving competitive, competitiveness, and CSR folks were more competitive on average in the control groups. And more recently, Piskunovitz in 2013 conducted a Cloninger temperament and character inventory um, in a case control method, 32 patients with CSR or CSC, 30 control patients. She found that um, CSR patients had a higher risk avoidance, greater restraint, less extravagance, more quick-tempered, more disorganized. They were more easily frustrated, higher level of attachment, greater dependence on approval of others. They were more practical, on a bright note, uh, more emotionally withdrawn, higher level of, of anticipatory anxiety, and a higher level of insecurity. So not very flattering, and not much you could change that I know of in my central serious patients, so I don't really go into detail on a, a character inventory. Pregnancy is known to have higher cortisol levels, especially during the third trimester, which usually resolves spontaneously after birth, but this is a risk factor for central serous. Stress is well known to uh, trigger central serous, and so is Cushing syndrome. There's a few other things in this um, grab bag. We got exogenous testosterone administration. Uh, Jeremy Wolf recently published, uh, I think, eight patients that had uh, exogenous testosterone and also had central serous. Erectile dysfunction, organ transplantation has been associated, systemic lupus erythematosus, hypertension, and the use of pharmaco psychopharmacologic medications is also associated with central serous. H. pylori also associated, not sure what to make of this at this point, uh, back in 2004 in France, uh, they looked at 78 central serous patients and 40% of them had H. pylori versus 25% in the controls. In Spain, four years later, they found that 69 or 70% of central serous patients, again, 16 patients, smaller group, had, had H. pylori versus uh, only 30% in controls. We don't really uh, know what to make of this, and I, I believe I saw a study where H. pylori, H. pylori was treated in the central serous patients that had it, and it didn't affect uh, clinical outcome. Something that's more near and dear to my heart is obstructive sleep apnea. Studies have shown an association between central serous and increased sympathetic activity, higher levels of catecholamine, and high blood pressure, which are all implicated in obstructive sleep apnea. So in Switzerland in 2008, Kloos looked at his 36 patients with central serous, 30 males and 6 females, and noted that 22% of them uh, ended up with obstructive sleep apnea of the males. And that was based on, he gave them an Epworth sleepiness scale, which is like a survey, and the ones that had a high enough score referred to pulmonary medicine, where um, they got sleep studies done. So um, in Turkey in 2014, all of these patients, 17 men, 6 women, had sleep studies performed, and 77% of the males had sleep apnea. Of this, They were all central serous, of course, and 17% of the females. I think you can broadly take away from these two studies that there's a higher prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in CSR males rather than CSR females, and it may or may not be higher than uh, the general population. Now, in this case, we are we do have some controls. I'll look at the one on the right. This is from uh, Levesque and David Zach's group in Michigan. They uh, both of these studies, by the way, gave Berlin questionnaires, so that's why I said OSA likely on my y-axis over there. So um, Levesque had 22 men, seven women, excluded steroid users, gave them all the Berlin questionnaire. Then for their controls, they age and gender matched them, so that. Uh, it was roughly double uh, the rate of OSA likely in the central serious folks compared to controls. Now, Brody in Pennsylvania in 2014, similar um, study, Berlin questionnaire again, controls, um, and this time though they matched age, gender, and body mass index, and so that was their conclusion as to why perhaps they did not find a difference is that they controlled for BMI. They also excluded steroid users and they had 48 patients. So. Uh, very interesting. So we we did a similar study at, with claims data um, in the United States Air Force Department of Defense population. We had 1.2 1, 2 million people that we looked at from 2009 to 2013. Of those 1.2 million people, that blue bar represents that 
109,000 of those that had obstructive sleep apnea, so it's 9% of the general population. I excluded uh, kids uh, under the age of 10. And 22% of my central serous patients had obstructive sleep apnea. That was 397 out of 1830 patients. So big numbers. We ended up with a risk ratio of 2.7 with tight confidence intervals. Um, so you could kind of, the takeaway message for me is, if you have central serous, you're 2.7 times more likely to have sleep apnea than the average Air Force person. And we're not just talking active duty here. We also looked at retirees, dependents, meaning uh, kids and spouses of active uh, duty military members. I split it up into females and males. Females roughly twice as likely to get uh, sleep apnea if they had central serous. Males a little bit more than two times, 2.4 times likely. So I think it's very compelling uh, data. And that basically sums up our associations and introduction to central serous. The next lecture is going to talk about imaging and uh, differential. And I think it'll be a little bit more interesting, honestly, because there's a lot more pictures, a lot less studies. But two takeaway messages here, steroid use, um, you please, please, please ask about flonase and nasonix. Inhaled steroids are much more likely to be implicated with central serous than any other form of steroid based on uh, the Carvalho Recchia study. And I found that to be true in my practice. In fact, if you ask the average patient if they're on steroids, they don't even think about the flonase that they're taking. So you have to specifically ask about inhale, any inhaled medications whatsoever, any topical uh, steroids that they're taking for their eczema, anything like that at all should be documented and coordinated to potentially stop. The second take-home message is I send all of my central serious patients for a sleep study, and I highly encourage others to do that. Even though I only show 22% of uh, central serious patients having sleep apnea, that was claims data, which is kind of dirty. In my own clinical practice, it's well over 75 to 80% of the males have sleep apnea that also have central serious. So I would encourage you to, to, to send them even if they say they don't snore. Um, so uh, I don't normally do this, but I want to show you a picture of my family. Um, we are um, preparing to move to Africa next year, and uh, we are having to raise our own support. So if you are at all interested, uh, we would love to accept your donation on a one-time or monthly basis. You can give a, a buck if you want. And if you do want to give, and I don't want you to feel pressure to, um, that's the, uh, the URL to go to. If you also Google Baskin Space WHM World Harvest Mission, um, which is Serge's former name. I'm basically going to Burundi to do eye surgery. Um, there's four other eye docs there taking care of 10.5 million people. There's a big need, and um, I'm very excited about it. Uh, these, this is one website where you can see some of my lectures. This is my wife's website that talks about sort of our travels. We took all six of our kids to Burundi back in April. And if you're not looking at it at on YouTube right now, this is the URL to see other lectures that I've posted there. Anyway, thank you for your time. Here are my references for this lecture and some of the upcoming lectures. Um, have a great day. Thanks.